Hi and welcome to Weapons of Mass Instruction. This is the third in our series of seven videos for our week-long celebration of Pi Day. If you missed the first two, you can find them either on my Facebook page or my YouTube channel. In the last video, we looked at the trigonometric functions sine, cosine, and tangent. Today, we're going to look at their inverses. Before we talk about inverse trig functions, I want to talk to you a little bit about inverse functions in general. If y equals f of x is a function, you can think of x as the input of f and y as its corresponding output. In order to qualify as a function, f must have one and only one output for each of its inputs. This will be important later. If y equals f of x has an inverse function, denoted f inverse, that's what this superscripted negative 1 means, that's not an exponent, this is read as f inverse, then the outputs of f are the inputs of f inverse, and the inputs of f are the outputs of f inverse. That's totally confusing, I know, so let's look at an example to illustrate. If f has an inverse function, and f of 3 equals 8, then f inverse of 8 equals 3. See how the inputs and outputs trade places in the inverse function? Let's steer the discussion back to trigonometric functions. We know that the sine of pi over 6 equals 1 half, so we might expect that the inverse sine of 1 half equals pi over 6. Again, the input and output values trade places in the inverse. Note how the sine function accepts an angle as its input and returns the ratio opposite over hypotenuse as the output. The inverse function, on the other hand, accepts the ratio as its input and returns an angle as its output. There's one sticky part about this, though. Not every function has an inverse function. Let's see why that is by continuing to look at the sine function. Here I've graphed one period of the sine function from 0 to 2 pi. I've also labeled a few points on the graph. To get the graph of the inverse, you just swap the x's and y's in the coordinates of the points. When I do that, I get this graph in red, and there's a problem with it. Take the value x equals 0, for instance. See how the y values 0, pi, and 2 pi are all outputs for this particular input? Functions don't do that. Functions only return one value as an output for any valid value of the input. So we have a problem here. Now if you look at any scientific calculator, you'll see that they all do have inverse trigonometric functions programmed into them. In this segment, we'll look at how to overcome the difficulty in the previous slide to get those functions. Strictly speaking, sine of x doesn't have an inverse function. Neither do cosine or tangent. So how do we get the inverse trig functions that appear in our calculators? Here's how. We solve this problem by restricting the domains, that is the set of x values or inputs, of the trig functions. This restricts the ranges, which is the set of y values or outputs, of the inverse trig functions. Here's how we restrict the sine function. We limit the domain to the closed interval from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. A closed interval includes its endpoints, and these brackets indicate that the interval is closed. We only allow this part of the function to have an inverse. That way, we get an inverse sine that's a proper function. Here's how we restrict the cosine function so that we can define its inverse. We cut off the domain to the interval 0 to pi. And here's the inverse cosine. And here's how we treat the tangent function to make it invertible. We restrict its domain to the open interval from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. An open interval does not include its endpoints, and we use parentheses instead of brackets to indicate that the interval is open. We can't include the endpoints in the domain because the tangent function is not defined at those points. The range of the tangent function is all real numbers, which we denote as the open interval from negative infinity to infinity. And here's the inverse tangent function. Note how the vertical asymptotes of the tangent function become horizontal asymptotes of the inverse tangent function. In the first video, I told you that pi is approximately 3.14159, and that the decimal expansion continues forever without repeating. At the time of this recording, pi is known to about 31 trillion digits. How does one compute the digits of pi? In this segment, we're going to use an inverse trig function to start to answer that question. From the unit circle, 
we can see that the tangent of pi over 4 equals 1. In fact, I presented that very example in the last video. Since x equals 1 is in the domain of the inverse tangent function, we can say that the inverse tangent of 1 is pi over 4. Furthermore, the inverse trig functions have series representations just like the trig functions do. Recall that in the last video, I approximated the sine of x using its Maclaurin series. Here's the Maclaurin series for the inverse tangent. Its terms are nice and predictable. They alternate signs, have odd exponents, and those odd exponents appear in the denominators. Now plug in x equals 1. We get that the inverse tangent of 1 is equal to 1 minus 1 third plus 1 fifth minus 1 seventh and so on. But the inverse tangent of 1 is pi over 4, remember? So let's make that substitution. Now we'll multiply both sides by 4 to solve for pi. Here's a fancier way to write this formula. This n is a counter that runs from 0 to infinity. This symbol here is sigma, which is the Greek letter s, and that s stands for summation, which means that we're going to add up a bunch of terms. What terms? These terms right here. In the numerator, we have negative 1 to the n, which alternates the signs, plus, minus, plus, minus. And in the denominator, we have 2n plus 1, which is an odd integer. So now we have our first formula for pi. Now, of course, we can't sum the infinitely many terms in this formula. So instead, we'll approximate pi by stopping the sum at an upper limit of capital N. We can then obtain pi to any desired accuracy by making capital N sufficiently large. I'm labeling our approximation as pi sub capital N. Let's do some sample calculations. Here's pi sub zero. We get it by plugging n equals zero into the formula. This is not such a good approximation of pi as you can see. It overshoots pi. Here's pi sub 1, which includes the next term in the series. Now we're undershooting pi. Here's pi sub 2. Again, we've overshot pi, but not by as much as pi sub 0. And here's one more, pi sub 3. It undershoots pi, but not by as much as pi sub 1. Continuing this process repeatedly, we'll eventually close in on pi to any desired precision. However, do we really want to do this by hand? That'll be a no from me, dog. And that's why we'll be continuing this on the computer. I've written a C++ program to do the calculations for us. The program asks for capital N, the upper limit of summation. It computes the formula in the slides. And it spits out an approximation for pi. Let's see how this works out for us. So now I'm going to run the program. And we'll start by reproducing the calculations that I showed you in the slides. Start with n equals 0. We get 4, just like before n equals 1, n equals 2, and 3. It's a lot faster this way, but we're not approaching pi very quickly here. Let's try a bigger value of n, like 100. So when n is 100, we're computing 101 terms, and still we don't have the hundredths place digit yet. We have 3.15. Let's try an even bigger number, like 1,000. 3.14, okay, and we don't have the thousandths place digit yet. Let's try one more iteration with 10,000. And we're getting there. But this is an awful lot of terms to use. So as you can see from my computer demonstration, this formula converges to pi very slowly. And indeed, it's not the best formula to use. In the next video in this series, I'll show you better formulas to get at pi faster. Stay tuned, and thanks for watching. Hey everybody, if you enjoyed this video and want to see more like it, then please do follow me on my socials. You know you want to.